Today is Friday, June 23rd, 2023. My name is Rita Jit, and I am interviewing Sonia Barana Rash on behalf of the Houston Asian American Archive at Rice University. So to begin, can you tell us where and when you were born? Sure. Um, I was born in Karachi, Pakistan, when August 26. Okay. How would you describe the household you grew up in? Um, I had my mother, my father, and two older siblings that were both uh, daughters. So it was three of us growing up in the same household. Mm -hmm. And what were your parents' occupations? My father was a bookkeeper, um, bookkeeper slash accountant. My mother was a nurse. What were some of their values or lessons that they instilled in you growing up? Specifically, hard work. Work hard, do the best you can in life. Uh, think about others also, because um, life is not just about you. It's also about giving back and doing what you can for other people. And, you know, one other thing is what comes around goes around. In other words, you do good for people and maybe one day somebody will do good for you. Right. I definitely see how that took shape in your public service career. Um, so you say you were born in Karachi. When did you move to Houston then? I think I was about three years old when we moved to Houston, and we have been here ever since. Other than visits every now and then as a child, um, we've lived here since I was very young. Mm -hmm. So you mostly grew up in Houston. How would yes. you describe the city as it was when you were growing up? Well, it, I think Houston's always been a diverse city, for sure, um, more now than ever, but the city, you know, it was always, as a child, and even still now, it's always been big. There's always something to do there compared to where I am here right now, but, uh, and I mean my city, but, um, you know, growing up in a city where there was some diversity, I think really helps, and it really helped to see other people once in a while, maybe not always in school, but in community affairs and things like that, that looked like me, uh, it helped, and I think it shaped who I am. Mm -hmm. Did your family celebrate traditional Asian holidays or traditions? Yes. So, uh, we celebrated, I'm, I'd like to say everything almost. <laughs> celebrated Christmas, but we also celebrated uh, our Nubros, Zoroastrian, we also celebrate Nubros, and so we did celebrate what we would consider now traditional holidays, but we also celebrated uh, Christian holidays too. Mm -hmm. So you would say religion played a big role in your upbringing? No. No? Okay. I Just wouldn't. Finding an um, opportunity to celebrate. <laughs> yeah, it was really in community. I mm -hmm. think community more than religion played. My parents were never ones that said that it was only one religion. Of course, we practiced our religion, but it wasn't, it, it, they were very fair when it came to everyone's religion. And even for me, it was something that, hey, you know, this is what it means to be a Zoroastrian. It's not always about going to church or going to, uh, religious things. It was about having good thoughts, good deeds, and good words. I see. That's really interesting. So I read that you attended the High School for Performing Arts in Houston. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what role the arts played in your childhood? So, and that's a really good question. I say that because growing up, growing up in a, a AC family, mm -hmm. arts wasn't something that was normally pushed. For Daisies. It was more about study, 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 school, school, school. So growing up, um, my parents weren't aware of really what the arts were. I mean, they knew what it was, but uh, when I was growing up, I used to watch a lot of PBS opera shows. And I'll, I remember seeing some opera on there and I could sing like that at a really young age. And I know that both my parents worked very hard and they had most, my dad would have three jobs sometimes and my mother worked hard. So anything that I wanted to do, like go to HSPBA high school for performing arts, I knew that I would have to step up, do my own research, find out how to do this, you know, where I need to go in order to just get heard basically. 
So when what got me interested was the idea that I could sing like these people on PBS, on public channels. And I will never forget that back then they had record stores and I had no idea who any opera singers were. I just knew that I could probably sing like that. So I went inside of a record store. I asked my dad, hey, can we go to this record store? He takes me there. And I asked the clerk, I'm like, you know, I really, I want an opera song for a girl. And the guy was like, well, who do you want it from? And I said, I don't know. But and he said, okay, well, this is a popular lady. Um, and he just handed me a record. And so I went home back in the old days, we had record players. I put it on my record player and I practiced and I practiced and I practiced. And then the performing arts high school came to our middle school and I signed up to audition. And there's a whole long story behind that, but to make it very short, I brought my record with me and the, the instructor was like, we don't use records here. You know, you, where's your sheet music? Where, give it to the pianist. And I didn't have any of that, but I sang that without it, a cappella. And I was fortunate enough, very fortunate enough to be one of the only students they selected without a musical background. What also that meant was a lot of hard work while I was there because I had to catch up with a lot of really talented students. But that's where my musical love, I guess, came from. Yeah, it's really cool how hard work and the arts kind of went hand in hand in your youth. Yeah. And then in high school, you were a part of, sorry if I'm pronouncing this wrong, but Teatro Bilingual? bilingual? Yeah, Teatro Bilingual de Houston. Okay, great. Did that you know is, about that? Yeah. Yeah, so what was that? That was in Houston for many, many years. There is an individual by the name of Pancho Claus. Pancho Claus worked it, with communities that were less fortunate. And they would do perform performances and we would go, we would go when I worked with them, we would go to different areas that were underprivileged that really didn't have um, the, they didn't have the ideas of, hey, let's, and quite frankly, they didn't have the economic ability too, because all, even like us, families worked hard and the students or the, the kids never had an opportunity for the most part, not everybody to go and see musicals or to go and see plays. And so we tried to bring them with Pancho Claus. We tried to bring it to the community. And that was really rewarding because you got to see different aspects of everyone's life. And even though I was tell people, even though we may be different by the way we look, we are so similar in the, our actions and our beliefs. So. That's really cool. Um, and just lastly, to close out the childhood section, is there any favorite memory that sticks out to you? Favorite memory? Gosh, I don't know. I had so many. Um, you know, uh, I can tell you some memories that have made me who I am as a child, perhaps. Uh, so growing up, I grew up in the late 70s, early 80s. I think I was, I can't remember. I was probably in second grade and it was a time when, so don't quote me on the years. It was a time when there was a war, there was an Iraq, uh, Iran war. Again, I was super young, but I do remember certain things in my childhood. One of them was that there was a lot of hatred towards people that looked like myself, my family, my parents, or whatever, their friends, things like that. And we would there was comments always made, you know, go back from where you come from. You don't belong here. Uh, you look funny. You got a big nose. I mean, there was a whole bunch of really cool comments, even to kids, even to us, you know, and there is just one memory that I always tell people that really has always stood out and kind of shaped who I am, I think, throughout the rest of my life. Um, it was with my older sister and she was coming out of middle school at the time and there were these two boys and they were right behind her and they were just screaming at her and going you know you got to go back from where you come from and you don't belong in our country and I to this day still remember her walking uh, to our car where we were waiting to pick her up from school and she was just crying as she was walking and these kids were just behind her yelling at her and 
I think that memory has been ingrained in my mind to shape who I am so that I know in my heart of hearts that, you know, we got to help people protect people who can't always protect themselves or help themselves. And that we need to make sure that everyone is treated fairly, kindly, and with respect. So that I think that's one of the memories that has shaped me. That's always been burned into my memory and made me who I am. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Moving on to college, what made you interested in studying political science at Our Lady of the Lake University? So I actually started off as a music major for my first two, almost one and a half to two years because I got a music scholarship and I enjoyed it. However, uh, I went to one of my counselors, college counselors, and I asked her, Now, I, I mean, college was I went to a private school, so it was fairly expensive. And I, when I asked one of my teachers, I said, hey, what can I do with my music degree? And when she told me I could work in a record store, um, I knew at that time that I was not going to spend so much money working in a record store. And I, yeah, I loved music, but I was also very realistic, unless you're the best of the best of the best. Um, having a prof professional career where you can actually live off of was probably not going to happen for me. Um, so I went into something that I thought I really loved to do also, and that was political science. I love to hear about government, how it worked, why people did sometimes what they did. And that was actually my minor was philosophy. Um, so I switched that and I was switched my music major because again, I was working in a music store for like a hundred thousand dollars in debt or so, and it probably wasn't a hundred thousand, by the way, I'm just exaggerating with that, but, um, that I just, I really, truly enjoy learning about people, learning about our government system, learning about why certain things happened a certain way in the past and how we can make sure Hopefully it doesn't happen again in our future. And that was a lot about history and how our, our basic government works. Did you have any mentor figures during your education? Yes, I had, um, I'm trying to think, I know one right away. Um, I had, when I say mentors, I had a couple of people who believed in me and I think that to me was a mentor. I, one was in high school, my music, our music conductor teacher, she was the head of the department at the time, uh, Pat Bonner. And uh, that meant a lot because again, I was the underdog. I did not come into that school with the knowledge that everyone else came in with when it came to the music and you had to maintain a certain GPA and you had to do certain things just to remain at high school in, in that high school so sh I was very grateful she gave me the chance every single year because you had to audition every year and every year I auditioned and again I was always I felt I was always behind everybody else because I started very late but I think she saw that I was doing my best and that I was I was working very hard when maybe other people didn't need to work as hard and I respected that so much about her. And then when I got older, I worked in as a law clerk. I was in law school and a little after law school for a judge. And he was definitely a mentor. He was somebody who taught me how to treat people with kindness, that no matter what you're, where you are in life, that everybody deserves to be treated with respect. And, you know, he didn't have to be that way, right? I mean, he was a judge sitting on a district, it was a district court judge, and, but he was, he was a good person, great personality, very kind to everybody, and I would say he was also one of my mentors. He would, he would uh, give me a lot of opportunities, and I tell people all the time, somebody gives you an opportunity, take it. Yeah, 
Um, after receiving your undergraduate degree, you went on to get a master's in international economics from St. Mary's University. Uh, what made you decide to pursue higher education? I love studying and I didn't want to work. <laughs> but I, that actually it was true. I mean, I, I really loved at that point. It was, I got a late start in life when it came to finding my passion, finding my passion to learn that is. I, I was not a great student whatsoever until I found something that clicked with me. And that was literally when I started um, college. Once I started college, that's when I think I matured enough to realize that I loved what I'm doing. And then I went to a graduate school because one of the reasons was um, I loved learning. I know that sounds so weird now. And I didn't, it wasn't like that growing up. It was literally late in life. I say late in life. It was my college years that I found, I found the knowledge that I wanted that learning was learning new things. And I guess being around people who also like those same things. But that's why I went and I got my graduate degree. And I love, I, at the time, I liked economics. Now, you know, 20 plus years later, um, don't ask me to do a lot of economic problems or things like that because I probably couldn't be able to. Maybe some basic stuff now. And when did that switch between international economics to I want to go to law school happen sure. for you? Oh, I, I think I always knew I wanted to go to law school. That's why I got my political science degree. Um, because literally, there's not much you can do with a political science degree either. Um, but I wanted to go to law school. And that switched. I really didn't switch. I just knew I wanted to go. It was basically putting myself in the right mindset to go to a place that was cost effective. Because after two degrees, um, it gets fairly expensive. And then to add a third degree too, it's, it's even more expensive. So, but I always knew I wanted to go to law school, do something to help people. I see, it's more of a continuation of your studies. Right. Yeah. So outside of all that coursework, I know you were kind of heavily involved with the community, so much so that you even received the presidential award. Um, can you tell us what that community service aspect looked like for you? Sure, I think that was the president. The one you're speaking of, because I did receive one recently too, but the one you're speaking uh, things, the one you're speaking of is the one that I received uh, during my graduate school. And it was, so I used to intern and I did an internship with a organization called um, Justice, Justice in the Maculadores. I'm probably mixing the two up a little bit. I know it's Mac Justice in the Maculadores, so it's something like that. So I know that, but that internship involved heavy researching into how people, our, our big corporations here would go to the border towns of Mexico and hire people to work in manufacturing jobs and pay them literally pennies. And they would build these shanty towns so they could live in there, pay them not enough to go back to their own hometown during the week. They would live there so they could work for whatever our, the U.S. corporations were at that time. Um, and it got me involved where, where I thought, hey, that's not right. You know, it was unsanitary. They couldn't go home. They lived in shacks with other people making whatever the product was. I mean, we were selling the product. We meaning our, the companies were selling the products for like two, $300. And these people were getting like six cents every hour. So I started working with that organization, Justice in the Maculadores, and doing some other community outreach programs while I was in graduate school and trying to be more involved as much as I could. And so I was really honored when I got that award and it was very unexpected. And since you brought up the second presidential award, I'd love to hear more about that one too. Sure. So now, and now um, some of the things that I do, including being a judge, is I also like to make sure that I give back to the community as much as I can. Um, 
And so I was blessed enough to be honored with one of the, with a presidential award. And I think this was, this was at the beginning of this year for some of my community activities that, um, that I've, I've done, I've assisted in and, you know, it's, it was nice to get, but of course, I always think to myself, it's not the reason we do it, not to get any type of awards or even to be recognized because of, for me, the the feeling of just doing something, something worthwhile that that hopefully my children, your other children or neighbors can say, hey, you know what? Maybe we want to help too. Maybe we want to get involved too in whatever it is that needs to be done. Right. I think it's certainly a kind of work that kind of rewards itself. In terms of your career, how did you transition from working for a law firm to opening your own practice? Well, so I worked for a law firm and what wound up happening is as I was working, I was working probably about 60, I might get probably exaggerate, 60, 70 hours a week with no break. And it was on the weekends, on the weekday. I think one time I remember I worked like three months and I must have had like one or two days off. And I thought, well, this is, I'm really working really hard. I'm busting my hump out here. And then what happened was I met my husband and we decided together that maybe I should slow it down a little bit because I was getting married. And so I decided, hey, this may be the right time for me to put up my own shingle, so to speak, and start my own business and do it at a pace that I felt comfortable to not only have a family life, but also a work life. So that's what kind of triggered me to start on my own. And then can you tell us about the experience of being elected as the Fort Bend County Justice of the Peace? Sure. It was, I'm going to tell you honestly, it was a difficult, difficult thing to do as when you run as a candidate. And I say this, whether you're in a big county or a little county or like us, I would say a medium-sized county. I mean, we are on the, Fort Bend is on the border of Harris County, of course. We're almost 1 million people. So it's not huge right now, but it's growing. And running, running to be a candidate, you ha- you're vulnerable. Every aspect of your life is vulnerable. Every, you know, people will say things about you've got to have thick skin because people will say things that are, majority of them are not true. You've got to be able to smile and understand that sometimes people can be ruthless and mean and you have to move past that and you've got to, once it's over, you've got to move past it and come together as a team to do what's good for the whole community. But it was not an easy, it was an, it was not easy. I'm going to let you know, it was not, I must have knocked on at least, I don't know, in my head, I'm thinking maybe three or 4,000 doors by myself. I didn't have, at that point, I didn't have any team Um, I did have a handful of volunteers. I have to say they were high school volunteers and they did what they could because they were still in school too, but it was perseverance, hard work, and quite frankly, not giving up. Even if people told me, hey, you're not going to be able to do it. You don't have enough finances. You don't have enough manpower. Um, you've got to juggle, you know, your family, because as a woman, that's the first thing that people always ask me certain questions about, you know, how are you going to do this with kids? And how are you going to do this with your husband? What is he going to think? Um, so it was tough. But I tell you this, anything worthwhile doing is going to be tough. And you just push through it, because you know, that that's what you truly want to do in your heart of hearts, that you do what you can. And keep going until you reach the goal that you want to have or in your career or in your future or even with people. Yeah, that sounds really demanding. Um, Kind of, it was. Can you imagine, see right now, it's probably like 110 degrees outside. And it was a lot of days of 105 degree walking. It was a lot of days of getting rained on, but still 
pushing through it. I mean, that's what it takes. It's, I always like to tell even my kids, um, anything you want, you got to practice at. I mean, no one for the most part is automatically good at something as soon as they wake up. And so to me, it was like a race. I mean, I had to keep going and I had to be very uh, dedicated to waking up every morning. I had a schedule um, and attempted to raise funds too to pay for certain things in a candidacy. Yeah, so not only mentally, but also physically challenging going out there. Right, absolutely. And we had opponents. And so that was even, you know, add that onto it. You had to make sure you were better than your opponent and that you were getting out there and your message was getting out there. Mm -hmm. And have you felt any discrimination being an Asian and a woman to serve on the bench? Uh, not, you know, I haven't felt discrimination while I'm on the bench, but I, I'll tell you this. One thing that I have seen as I have gone through this is that, yes, there is noticeably sometimes a difference in our South Asian community towards each other. I do see, and which is very unfortunate, I see sometimes women, instead of helping each other out, they um, tend not to vote for other women. They tend not to vote for, if the South Asians tend sometimes, not all the time, tend not to vote for other South Asians. And by no means do I ever advocate for someone to vote for me or anyone else because of their gender, their religion, uh, the color of their skin at all. I, I'm a strictly, I strictly believe that you vote for the person because they are the right person for the job. They have experience and then they're qualified. But in the same respect, if you have somebody like that, why not vote for that person if they're also in your same community? Or why not support a person? Um, I, I have found that it's, again, unfortunate that sometimes I, the pushback I get are from other South Asian women, sometimes from our men too. Um, and I don't really know why, why that happens. I don't see a lot of other cultures do that as much as I have in our own culture. Um, there's a lot of tribal mentality here, which quite frankly, growing up in America, I, I don't know why certain people can't move past where um, they may be raised and born in other countries, but we're here in America, and I respect that, but we're here in America now, and it's time for us. We work together as a community of Americans, and so I do see Unfortunately, there's a lot of tribal mentality where it is one culture, one religion against another culture and another religion. Um, we were never brought up that way. And so that was a little new to me when I started running. That was a little new to me, seeing how people could act towards somebody else based on based on where they were born and not based on any other reason. So mm, that's really frustrating, especially when representation is. that looks like us is so important. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what are the duties of a justice of the peace specifically, and how different are they from other elected or appointed judges? Okay. Good question. So a justice of the peace is what we like to call the people's court, because more people come into a JP court than any other courts because we handle small claims of $20,000 or less. We handle cases like truancy when kids don't go to school. We handle uh, credit card debt. We also handle cases that deal with misdemeanors, uh, criminal misdemeanors, class C. We handle in the civil side, we also handle um, small claim evictions. So there, it's a whole gambit a whole gambit of law basically that we handle here. And I say it's the people's court because the cases that come into our court are cases that your neighbor might file or you might file, you know, a, a car wreck case that's less than $20,000 or $20,000 or less. It may be a contractor that came into your home and didn't do the 
didn't do the job the way you wanted them to, a landscaper who didn't cut your trees the way that, you know, you paid them to do it. So we get a lot of case filings. I see a lot of people on a daily basis, which, you know, to them, these problems are serious. They're serious because we think sometimes that, oh, they're suing somebody for $3,000. And it may not be that much to one person, but for the person that's suing it, it's, you know, it's a lot to them. And so um, those are some of the types of cases that I get to hear and see in trial from the whole week. Normally it's Tuesday through Thursday. We have trials back to back to back to back going, going, going. And then on Fridays, what we like to see Fridays and Mondays are our catch up days to start reviewing all the documents, getting ready for the whole week. Um, so those are the cases. It's very busy. We, in my county in Fort Bend, we only have four, no, I'm sorry, in my precinct, I'm precinct three. I, Fort Bend County, we have four precincts and I'm three. And in three, I'm the only JP judge. So I hear all those cases for our precinct three. Okay, yeah, I was gonna ask about a typical day in your career, but I feel like I've got the whole week laid out now. Yeah. You do. <laughs> so also, I think you serve as the vice president on uh, the League of United Latin American Citizens and also the NAACP. Is that still so, a position or? Well, the NAACP, I, have, I had to step down because it conflict of interest if I'm a judge and according to their bylaws I'm still very actively involved in fact I'm I'm very proud that I was able to be the one of the third vice president the only third vice presidents they had because quite frankly I think I was I was the only person that has done that who was not African-American with the NAACP um but that organization is a wonderful organization because they they help everybody of color, everybody of color. And I think there's a misnomer sometimes that people think they that you only have to be one race in order to join certain organizations. And definitely that's not true with them. I, I know they well they welcomed me in and I loved working with them and doing whatever we could to help people that needed the help. So how long were you involved with LULAC and NAACP? So LULAC, I'm still their vice president. 2911, or chapters 2911, we actually brought it here to Fort Bend County. Um, I've been with LULAC, I don't know, three years, maybe three, four years uh, with the NAACP. I mean, being a member now still, I'm probably just as long, just as long as that too. So, and they're both very rewarding, rewarding organizations. You know, the problems we always face is getting more people involved. And what's your advice to people who are just looking for ways to get involved? Call me. <laughs> okay, sounds great. Call me. There's tons that people can do. I mean, nowadays, I tell you what, with, with our technology, if you, if people truly want to be involved, um, they can. The The thing that I'm finding with our young people though, they're not, they're not participating as much as they should be. And this is really their future. When we work hard, we work hard. Yes, we work hard for our future, but mainly we're working hard for your future, our young people's future. And when they're not even involved or participating, we wind up losing a lot of rights. And they wind up losing even more rights. I mean, nowadays, we know the climate of the political arena is, in my words, not that great. There are things that are happening that we would never have considered ever happening in my lifetime that are now happening. Um, and our young people have been so involved in their phones, in their laptops, that we do internships, for example, every summer, and even prior to for me, of me being here, we did internships, and I noticed there was such a disconnect between how they did not know how to interact with people compared to when I was growing up. 
um, our young people nowadays, I don't find a lot of young people who know how to shake somebody's hand and look them in the eye or in the face and say who they are. And these are young, I, when I say young people, they're not kids. I'm talking about college kids, see high school seniors. So they're old enough to know what appropriate appropriate actions are and reactions are. And so that worries me a lot that they're not involved in their own lives. Mm -hmm. And how do your community service experiences shape the work that you do in the courts? Well, it helps me look at both sides. Mm -hmm. I understand that something that may not be so serious to me is serious to that person. And something, it also helps me realize that we have got to put ourselves in somebody else's shoes once in a while to understand what they're going through. Um, never to judge people because, you know, somebody may be low on that day or that week or that year. And when we start judging who they are, what circumstances they are, we have to realize there's no guarantee that we may not be that person in a year or in a week or, you know, whatever it may be. So I think that's what's helped when I've done community service projects and um, still doing a lot of community service projects to understand that everybody has a story and nobody's life is perfect, even though maybe on the outside, it may appear that way to certain people, but we all have our ups and we all have our downs. And what makes us who we are is how we get back up when we are knocked down. Yeah, certainly. Um, so what is the most rewarding aspect of this public service career that you have? And what's the most challenging aspect? One of the most rewarding, well, I can, I'm going to give you more than one. One, I'm fortunate enough that I get to marry people. And so it's nice to see people on their best day. You know, it's nice to marry people that are want to get married. They're happily, they're happy that day. They're in love. So that's really rewarding to me. Another rewarding thing I think is with truancy cases, and those are the kids that come to my court who have missed school for a certain amount of time, um, being able to talk to them to find out what their root core is, why are they not here and helping them. I mean, I never want to, I never want to shut a door on, especially a, a child. I still call them children, even though some of them are 16 and 17, um, because a lot of times I will find people automatically assume, well, that child is just not a good child. That's why they're skipping school. They're skipping school. They're missing classes because, because of something. Um, and once I start talking to them and getting to the core reason why, realizing that, hey, it may not be their fault. I mean, some of these kids have to stay at home to take care of their siblings. Some of them have to stay at home because they have to help work to earn money in order to help the family. So the rewarding part of that is that giving them another opportunity. And then when they come back and they, most of them accomplish it. Most of them accomplish certain things that they need to accomplish when they come back to court to make sure that they are not truant um, and getting their education. So those are some of the things. And then also doing the right thing. I mean, just being fair, following the law, and not placing one person uh, or, you know, one group ahead of another, making sure it's an evil, even playing field for everybody when they come in here and treating them with respect. Yeah, that sounds really lovely. Um, so now moving on to your identity and perspective section, how would you describe, how would you say you identify yourself ethnically? Um. South Asian American. Mm -hmm. and yeah, I would say South Asian American. I mean, people often, when they have, and because this has come up, they have asked, uh, you know, you, you're the first Pakistani to do this, or you're the first South Asian to do this. And I, I, frankly, which is great. I, you know, I, I'm happy to, to blaze a trail for other people, but 
I am more happy to blaze that trail. So I'm not the, maybe the first of something. I may be the first Fort Bend County Pakistani judge, but more importantly, I just don't want to be the last. And so it's not, it's not as important to be, it's important to be the first, but it's not as important. My identity is more about, hey, let's all get together and let's all work together in unity, no matter where you're from and accomplish something that is good for everybody. And how do you think that more South Asians and Asian women can be encouraged to become judges and serve the public the way that you do? Get involved, get involved. I mean, that's the best way to volunteer. I mean, if somebody wants to be a judge or even a lawyer, um, call, call a judge up, call a lawyer up. Don't be, don't be scared to do that. Talk to them, ask some questions. Um, there's only one way you're going to find out how, what something's like is if you ask questions. I always tell the young kids that I have volunteering or the interns is that the law is nothing like television. Court is nothing like television. Um, television, it's very exciting and it's entertaining. And the reality is um, it's not always... <laughs> Like the majority of the time, it's not. I mean, we're not, deal at least in my court, I'm not dealing with life or death cases. You're not going to have somebody standing, sitting in the stand saying, okay, I did it and crying. Um, so television is very different than the reality of it. So getting back to your question, how did we get, what would I tell people? Call lawyers, call judges, ask them how you can volunteer. Ask them how you can get involved in a campaign, for example, if you're interested in being a judge, find out about the hard work, find out about what you can do and to be committed. That's the one thing that I always tell people that if you are going to volunteer, if you're going to say you're going to do something, then say it, make your word mean something. Yeah, I think it's inspiring how far questions can take you. Yeah. Absolutely. And now moving on to your current household, can you just describe it and the people within it right now? They're crazy. <laughs> I have uh, I have my husband, Ron, and Ronald or Ron, and he is also a lawyer. Um, we've always done different laws. Thank you. Or, the, or else we would clash. But, um, and then I have two little girls. Well, not so little. I have one teenager right now, and that's super fun. Um, she's... 13, almost 14 years old, and I've got a seven-year-old. And so it's a ju it's juggling. A lot of it is balancing and juggling. It's not always easy. I'm very lucky that I have a supportive spouse because I don't think it would be possible at all to do what I'm doing without a supportive spouse. Um, but I always have to, I miss out sometimes. I mean, that's that's very unfortunate. I miss out sometimes on important things with my family and with my kids. And I wish I could say that I'm always there for them, but I know I'm not. And that that's painful sometimes, but you know, they understand, they understand they're good kids. And so I couldn't have been more blessed to have them. They, uh, my family is always comes first. They always come first. And of course, her, um, my work will always come second, but I enjoy, I enjoy when I'm able to be at home and stay at home with them. And like I said, they're, they are rowdy girls. That's they're, really lovely. Yeah. <laughs> and do your children have similar aspirations to you? Not at all. <laughs> I'm like, not at all. Um, it depends on the month and the mood that they're in. So my oldest daughter, um, at some point, she wanted to be a physician. At this point, she wants to be a pilot. So if you ask me again in about six months, it may be something different. My seven-year-old wants to be, I think at one point, she wanted to be a princess mermaid. Um, right now, she wants to be a princess singer. So uh, one thing... Uh, you know, and I have two very different kids, two very different children with different personalities. And I've always decided I'm not going to push. My husband and I are never going to push any career path for them. We've always told them, especially my oldest one, 
we don't care what you do in life as long as you're happy with your choice and that you can survive on your own. Um, in other words, that you don't, you won't be needing assistance from your spouse, your partner, uh, anybody else that you, whatever career choice you decide that you will be able to walk and stand on your own because as most parents tell their kids, we're not going to be around forever. So you need to be able to make those choices in life that keep you happy, that keep you grounded, and also that you are able to sustain a life and have you know, a place to live and food to eat. My youngest one, she's still too young to have any of these type of discussions about the reality of life and the reality of you've got to work hard for what you want. And life is not like living at home with your mom and dad who just provide whatever you need for you, for yourself. Yeah, that's great. Although if you were to push a career, I think Princess Mermaid Singer is a great one. Yeah, I would love to do that too. Yeah. And do you still keep music around in your life? Because I know I was a choir kid in high school and it never oh. really quite goes away. Yeah, it never goes away. You know, you hear something like I will hear, I'll go to a lot of events and people will be saying the uh, Star Spangled Banner. And then I'm in the background going, oh, I like really loud. <laughs> yeah, no, it never goes away. I mean, you know, it is, yeah, it's something that I enjoy doing still, but not, you know, not in public. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> and what about other hobbies? In your, I know it's a limited free time, but what other hobbies do you like to do? If I had a lot of time, or at least time to do like um, a hobby, I think I would, I enjoy it reading certain things. I enjoy watching uh, master classes. I know it sounds strange. Master classes is like where you've got all these people who are experts in their fields and they give like this, uh, they give this class basically, and they tell you all these different things about their field. Um, those are things I really like to do. And, and okay. And also, quite frankly, I like playing video games. I hate admitting that, but that is one of the things I like to do sometimes at nighttime to kind of decompress. And I know my husband will be like, I think it's time for you to put it away. It's midnight. I'm like, okay, just one more game. But um, yeah, those are, I think, some of my hobbies. No, oh, I think that's great. And if you could go back in time to tell your younger self one thing, what would it be? Um. Don't listen to other people. In other words, and whether those people are friends, families, acquaintances, teachers, whoever they are, if you want something in life and somebody's telling you you can't do it because you're not making the you're not making the grades to do it. You can't do it because you don't have that ability to do it. You can't do it because of whatever reasons. If you believe in yourself, I think for the most part, you believe in yourself, you're willing to work hard for what you want, most people can accomplish the things that they need in life. And I think I would have told my, my younger self that. And also don't take things so seriously. Life is short, enjoy it. So those are some of the things that I would have probably told my younger self. This is very broad, but what do you hope to achieve throughout your career and lifetime? I would love, you know, I think what I want to achieve, at least in this moment, because I'm sure it'll change again, because we're just always evolving into different things and different things, or our ideas are. Um, I, you know, I think for me right now, I would like it for people just to say, if whoever meets me, to go back with a good feeling about themselves, to know that I, I would like to inspire people to do more for the community, their community, any community. Um, if I could achieve anything, I'd like to, you know, help people to understand that they need to, as I said before, they need to be involved in the world, in, in, in their own lives. Um, they need to be involved 
um, in the communities that they live in. They need to know their neighbors, you know, they need to go outside once in a while and meet people beyond their little circle to understand that we all need each other and that we all are so much more similar than we are different. And if we just communicated with each other and talked to each other, we would find that out. I mean, I tell people all the time that as a mother, we all want safety for our kids. No matter what political party you're with, we all want safety for our kids. We all want safety in our in our communities, in our neighbors. Um, we all want to be treated respectfully. I mean, there are just some some basic common themes that we all have. So, you know, if I could just inspire people to understand that and to be good, just to be good, be good, do good, you know, think about somebody else. And once in a while, when you're doing something, if you see somebody pushing a car and I realize I'm saying, don't be safe, um, pull up, ask them, Hey, can I call somebody for you? Um, if you see somebody who doesn't have enough money, give them, if and you have it, you know, if you have it readily available, help them out. I think that would be probably my biggest message. Yeah, thank you so much. And I certainly feel inspired after talking to you. So oh, that's sweet. Thank you. <laughs> and is there anything else that you would like to share with us in general? I don't know. No, no. I mean, other than, um, you yeah. know. Good. Stay in school. No, um, <laughs> noted. <laughs> other than that, respect your parents. Yeah, because you know, as parents, we really work hard. For most of us, we work hard for our kids, and I know realize that most kids don't understand that until they're parents. Uh, but you know, most parents sacrifice a lot, whether we see it or not. And we may never see it, but if they're there every night for you and they're working, whether they're at home working or whether they're out at working, um, you know the majority of parents do that for their kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for taking the time yeah. out of your busy schedule to talk with us. I'm going to stop the recording here. Okay.